You want to come in here with me? Just to be safe? Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 intercultural love stories in movies. So what would a guy like that say? Well, he'd say, my name is Alex Hitchens and I'm a consultant, but she wouldn't be interested in that because she'd probably be just counting the seconds until he left. Straighten, I'm medically qualified, so I hope you wouldn't think it presumptuous if I say you ought to sit down before you fall down, I mean. I'm Jane. Jane, that's it? That's your name? Yeah. What's wrong with that? No, 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 nothing, nothing. It's a great name. I love that name. For this list, we'll be looking at big screen couples from different cultural or ethnic backgrounds that came together despite opposition. Since we'll be discussing the fates of a few couples, a spoiler alert is in order. Which intercultural love story is your favorite? Let us know in the comments. Number 20. Ian Miller and Fatula Tula Portakalis. My Big Fat Greek Wedding. <sighs> Did you want to see some brochures? Talk about relationship goals. Ian and Tula are one of the most well-known romantic comedy pairings due to their wacky love story. Throughout the film, they have to endure Tula's overbearing Greek family, who are skeptical of her marrying Ian, a non-Greek wasp. May I please date your daughter? No! Despite the meddling from her father, Tula and Ian are able to make it work. Because I came alive when I met you. But my family... You're a part of your family. And I'll do anything. Whatever it takes to get them to accept me. They're two people that complement one another, and their chemistry is off the charts. Audiences found their story relatable, and the small indie flick was a sleeper hit, going on to become the highest grossing romantic comedy of all time, even though it never topped the box office. Uh, here tonight, we have uh, apple and orange. Uh, we, we all uh, different, but uh, in the end, uh, we all fruit. <laughs> Number 19, Bruce Lee and Linda Lee Cadwell, Dragon the Bruce Lee Story. It's no secret that Bruce Lee was a martial arts legend, but this biopic explores a lesser known side of his life as well. Is this class only for guys? Because it looks like you only teach guys. No, I teach whoever wants to learn. The film provides a deep dive into the prejudice that the Chinese actor faced in Western culture. Although this was a difficult time for Bruce, he also met the love of his life, a Caucasian American named Linda Cadwell. Linda would become Bruce's martial arts student and much more. I miss you too! Seeing the struggles that Bruce has endured, Linda encourages him to reach for the stars, despite what others say. The film was based on a biography that Cadwell wrote around the same time that her husband died, so you know that the relationship depicted on the silver screen is a personal one. Linda, I forgot something. What? I forgot to tell you I love you. Number 18. Alex Hitch Hitchens and Sarah Milas. Hitch. So look, what you do with these babies is... Yeah, what I do with this baby is kick your ass! <laughs> African-American Alex Hitchens is a different kind of ladies' man. He's an expert at setting couples up, earning the nickname of the date doctor. I'd like to see the areas where I can afford to take some risks. Check your schedule. I check my schedule. That's cool. Great, let me give you my number. When it comes to his own love life though, Alex isn't always as smooth as you might think. My name is Alex Hitchens and I'm a consultant, but she wouldn't be interested in that because she'd probably be just counting the seconds until he left. Thinking he was like every other guy. Alex is attracted to a Latina woman named Sarah, but their first couple of dates aren't without some awkward hiccups. Benadryl. A lot of Benadryl. A lot, a lot of Benadryl. What, what? Mm -hmm. Even then, the chemistry between actors Will Smith and Eva Mendez is undeniable. A misunderstanding leads Sarah to believe that Alex helped a pig, but she eventually finds that Hitch is in the business of true love. I want everybody to take a good look at this right now, because this, this right here, this is exactly why falling in love is so goddamn hard. While Sarah's perception of romance has always been on the cynical side, Alex helps her to see that love is full of surprises. You kinda like me, huh? I love you. I love you, and I knew it from the first moment. 
Number 17. Kenya Denise McQueen and Brian Kelly – Something New Kenya is married to her work, but if she were to ever settle down, she always imagined herself with someone who understands the African-American experience. You wouldn't be waiting for someone by any chance. Someone named Brian? Why? I'm him. I'm Brian, actually. So when her blind date Brian turns out to be white, she runs in the other direction. Ever date a black girl? What kinds of girls? Mm. So you're a player. Fate brings them back together, and to Kenya's surprise, she falls for the chisel-jawed landscape architect. Yet her friends, family, and personal hang-ups constantly steer Kenya away. But you know what? You ought to feel real, real blessed that you even invited to this Negro spiritual. I am. You know what I'm saying? Hey, boo boo. Talk to you later. Brian, meanwhile, doesn't think about skin color, which Kenya sees as part of the problem. Even when she meets the perfect guy, however, Kenya can't get Brian out of her head. Something New isn't afraid to tackle race relations and traditional family values head on, which is what makes the central romance feel so honest. You're the one I want, Brian. I love you. I love you, Kenya. Number 16. Jack Malik and Ellie Appleton – Yesterday a low stuffed songwriter of Indian descent, Jack is so obsessed with music that he can't see what's right in front of him. I may do one more gig. I think I may have got some like, new songs. Is that your point for me? His white manager, Ellie, is beautiful, charming, and clearly in love with him. But Jack only has eyes for his guitar. Yeah, wow, that was uh, one of the best songs I've heard in my life. I mean, these things are complicated. Through a series of unusual events, Jack finds that he's seemingly the only one who remembers the Beatles. Jack seizes this opportunity to become a music sensation. Hi, I'm Deborah Hammer. I'm Ed's manager. We should talk. It isn't until Jack hits it big that he realizes how much Ellie means to him. <laughs> what are you doing here? Uh, well, it's research. It's like a music industry thing. Yeah. This is so great. <laughs> um, while Jack's Indian heritage does play a role in shaping the movie's identity, this is one intercultural love story where skin color is not the primary focus. As far as Jack and Ellie are concerned, all you need is love. I love you. I always have. Number 15. We Tungao and Simon – The Wedding Banquet Released in 1993, The Wedding Banquet came out at a time when it was still rare to see a film explore intercultural romance and even rarer for LGBTQ plus relationships to be discussed. My perfect woman. What? Another one? Don't those things cost a fortune? Yes, but how can I tell them to stop paying for them? Progressive in more ways than one, the romantic comedy revolves around a complicated love triangle between a Taiwanese man, his white boyfriend, and a Chinese woman who needs a green card. I wee wee. Wee wee. Take you wee tang. Wee wee. Okay. To be my wedded husband. To get his parents off his back, Wee Tung decides to marry Wei Wei, with Simon's encouragement. Wei Wei is on board with the sham marriage. The lie gets out of hand, taking the characters to unexpected places. Not Wei Tong, not Mother, not Wei Wei shall know our secret. But why? For the family. The ending challenges the idea of tradition, showing that love and family come in many different forms. Sam, Xi Xi, Xi Xi ni dog Wei Tong. Number 14, Jackie Brown and Max Cherry, Jackie Brown. Jackie Brown is Quentin Tarantino's love letter to the black exploitation genre, but he doesn't consider it a straight up black exploitation film. It's Brown. Yes. Take me. I'm Max Cherry. While you can see how strong black women like Coffee and Foxy Brown inspired Jackie, Pam Greer's Golden Globe nominated performance makes the character feel more grounded. You really a bail bondsman? Well, who do you think I am? I showed you my card in there. Can I see your ID? Something similar can be said about her understated romance with a white bondsman named Max. Are you scared of me? A little bit. In a performance that earned him an Academy Award nomination, the late Robert Forster masterfully plays Max with great subtlety. While Max doesn't frequently speak his mind, it's evident that he's developing feelings for the resilient Jackie as they become unlikely partners. Although the two ultimately go their separate ways, their final scene together is a fitting and satisfying one nonetheless. I'll send you a postcard. Will you? 
I see your little partner. Number 13, Hank Grotowski and Letitia Musgrove, Monsters Ball. I'm gonna touch you. There are so many things about this couple that shouldn't work on paper, but somehow they're able to overcome their differences to fall in love on screen. At the start of the film, Hank undeniably has his prejudices, but he's still drawn to Letitia and their similar experiences grieving loved ones. You gonna take her home, ain't you? I, I don't really know her. I, I'll take her home. As their relationship deepens, their attraction to each other amplifies and culminates in a charged encounter where Letitia asks Hank to make me feel good. Together, they're sensual, flawed, and feel very human, the latter being a quality that's not always found in Hollywood romances. Halle Berry went on to win the Best Actress Oscar for her raw portrayal of Letitia. My name is Letitia Musgrove, and uh, me and Hank is, uh, friends. Number 12, Derek Reynolds and Sarah Johnson, Save the Last Dance. Steps ain't no square dance. That's alright, I dance in circles, probably around you. This 90s teen power couple feels like people you might know in real life, making them one of the most relatable on our list. They start off as rivals of sorts, but they come together after he promises to teach her how to dance hip hop so that she'll fit in better at her predominantly black school. Take this out. Come on. Dance lessons lead to more, and it's a pleasure to watch this couple fight for their relationship despite the haters trying to keep them apart. White girls like you, creeping up, taking on men. The whole world ain't enough, you gotta conquer ours too. Whatever, Nikki. You know what, Derek and I like each other, and if you have a problem with that, screw you. Derek and Sarah are great together because they push each other to strive for their dreams, even if those dreams seemed far out of reach. The judge hates me. Forget him. Ain't nobody watching you but me. All right? Now show me some attitude. Number 11, Simon Spear and Blue, also known as Abraham Bram Greenfeld. Love, Simon. Love, Simon was celebrated for its portrayal of LGBTQ plus characters and all around diverse cast. Hey, morning, it's Simon. I, li I live right here. I like your, your boots. While we know that the titular Simon is white, we're unable to put a face to the mysterious blue for most of the runtime. Well, I've never told anyone about my Daniel Radcliffe phase, so now we're even. And for the record, I think Jon Snow is an excellent choice for your sexual awakening. Simon has a few suspects, including Bram, an African-American classmate, Cal, a Caucasian classmate, and Lyle, a Caucasian server, all of whom he finds attractive. Were you in bio when they did that identifying leaves test? Yes, and uh, Joel Winslow ate that poison ivy. Appearances aside, it's Blue's personality that won Simon over. In the climax, we learn that Simon's digital pen pal is Bram. Upon revealing himself, it's addressed that Bram is Jewish and black, but Simon isn't at all disappointed. Are you disappointed that it's me? No. He's just happy that he can finally kiss the boy he's been thinking about for months, making for an unforgettable Ferris wheel ride. Number 10, Penny Lou Pingleton and Seaweed J. Stubbs, Hairspray. While not this musical's central romance, Penny's relationship with Seaweed does tie into the overarching theme of acceptance, and their chemistry is adorable to boot. Penny, this is Seaweed. Seaweed, this is Penny. Oh! Taking place in 1962 Baltimore, integration is on the horizon, but many ignorant people wish to keep things segregated. Wow. Being invited places by colored people feels so hip! <laughs> this includes Penny's mother, who ties her daughter up for helping the outspoken Tracy. You will never leave this room again. Seaweed comes to Penny's rescue, however. Penny is willing to defy her mother and the police in order to help Seaweed, as well as their black friends. Never set me free. No, no, no. What's more, they're ready to face the challenges of being an interracial couple during such a prejudiced time. On live television, Penny announces to the world that she's a checkerboard chick. I am now Number 9, Calogero, C. Anello, and Jane Williams, A Bronx Tale. She was tall, she was beautiful, and she was classy. 
but she was black. And that was a no-no in my neighborhood. Based on the life of actor Chaz Palminteri, and adapted from his stage play of the same name, the movie introduces the audience to Calogero, a young Italian-American man who falls in love with Jane, an African-American girl. Set in 1960s Brooklyn, the story is one in which race plays a huge factor in keeping this couple apart, despite their natural attraction to each other. Their respective friends and family try to keep them away from one another, especially after Calogero is accused of beating up Jane's brother. Willie, are you sure it was him? I'm positive it was him. Please, don't believe him, I swear to God. Don't I didn't touch him. So you were there. Yeah, I was there, but I didn't do anything, Jane, believe me. Calogero and Jane are a great example of first love, and especially since the couple experiences hardships that move them from childhood to adulthood. I want to be with you, and I don't care what anybody I'm says. So Can I have a kiss? Sure. You're only one fellow's girl. Number 8. Lara Jean Covey and Peter Kavinsky To All the Boys I've Loved Before This romantic comedy established Vietnamese-born American actress Lana Condor as a certified leading lady. I write a letter when I have a crush so intense that I don't know what else to do. Rereading my letters reminds me of how powerful my emotions can be, how all-consuming. And Margot would say I'm being dramatic, but I think drama can be fun. Condor shines as Lara Jean, an awkward high school girl whose unmailed love letters to her past crushes are suddenly sent out. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh, oh, okay. Oh. One letter was for her sister's ex-boyfriend Josh, and another was for the hunky Peter. To prevent things from getting uncomfortable with Josh, Lara Jean and Peter engage in a fake relationship that just might be the real deal. Hi. There's no one like you, Cody. The romance that ensues is at times sweet, at times steamy, and always spellbinding. Their relationship isn't without hurdles, especially when Lara Jean is reunited with John Ambrose, who's played by African-American Jordan Fisher in the sequel. There was one letter that I remember being a little more intense than the others. It was mine, right? It was me, okay? In the end, however, Peter is the only boy for Lara Jean. How do we do this? What do you mean? Well, what do you put into a contract for a real relationship? Nothing. <laughs> You gotta trust. Number seven, Kumail and Emily Gardner, The Big Sick. Her dad just called and said that the contracts were her because the infection has reached her heart. In a screenplay that scored them an Oscar nomination, real life husband and wife Kumail Nanjiani and Emily V. Gordon loosely based The Big Sick on their romance. And with me, you're kind of just phoning it in a little bit. Uh, again with the comedy, the comedy, <laughs> all the time with the comedy. Nanjiani essentially plays himself a Pakistani American comedian. Woo! <laughs> really? You're not from Pakistan. I would have noticed you. Expected to commit to an arranged marriage, Kumail instead falls for a white student named Emily. What's your name in Urdu? Oh. Does this move work? I've had some minor success with it. The two break up shortly before Emily goes into a medically induced coma, putting Kumail in an unusual position. Taking care of Emily and getting to know her parents, Kumail only falls deeper in love. Be really good if you hold through. This makes things complicated when Emily finally wakes up, and with the added pressure from his family, Kumail isn't sure how to make things work. By following his dreams of stand up, though, Kumail eventually finds his way back to Emily. Heckling doesn't have to be negative. So if I was like, oh my god, you're amazing in bed, that would be a <laughs> heckle? Yeah, and now you're getting more laughs than me. Number six, Demetrius Williams and Mina, Mississippi Masala. I never thought I would fall in love with you. It's not that common to see a pairing of an African-American man and an Indian woman on screen, but that's exactly what we get in this underrated romantic drama. The film tells the story of Mina, a young Indian woman who relocates from Uganda to the United States. In Mississippi, she meets Demetrius, played by Denzel Washington, and the two fall in love despite the disapproval of their two families. I'm not sorry I'm in love with him. Who is he? What do you know about him? What about his family? This is America, Ma. 
What's fascinating about this movie is the fact that it's an intimate portrait of two marginalized groups that inflict that same racism they've experienced onto the couple. I know you and your folks can come down here from God knows where and be about as black as the ace of spades, and as soon as you get here, you start acting white and treating us like we your doormats. I know that you and your daughter ain't but a few shades from this right here. That I know. However, the lovebirds are able to overcome the prejudice and drama and choose each other, which makes them a stronger couple. Right. We've always said goodbye to other people. Number five, Frank Farmer and Rachel Marin, The Bodyguard. This interracial romance was originally conceived in the 1970s with Diana Ross and Steve McQueen in mind. The film was ultimately made in the 90s, starring Whitney Houston and Kevin Costner. You want to come in here with me? Just to be safe? Even in 1992, there was some controversy about an on-screen romance between a black woman and a white man. But Houston and Costner defended the casting. You afraid I might get picked off in my snazzy running suit? No, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to jog with you. Rachel's a singer slash actress slash diva, and Frank is her stone-faced bodyguard. And you're ready to die for me? It's the job. Although they come from very different backgrounds, the two come to respect and care for one another. While multiple love scenes were cut from this finished film, it accumulates to one of the most iconic goodbye kisses in cinematic history. Wait! And I will always love you. They may not fly off together, but as the theme song goes, they'll always love each other. Number 4. Richard Loving and Mildred Loving Loving A few couples on this list were based on real-life figures, but Richard and Mildred Loving may have the most profound love story. I'm gonna build you a house. Right here. Our house. Prior to this movie's release, it's possible that you'd never heard of the Loving vs. Virginia civil rights case, making it all the more shocking to learn what they went through. In here? What you doing in that bed, boy? Richard! What you doing in bed with that woman? Due to Virginia's anti miscegenation laws in 1958, the white Richard and black Mildred got married in Washington, D.C. Even then, Virginia refused to recognize the marriage, forcing them to leave their other loved ones. You knew what she was doing taking her up there. After years of persecution and multiple arrests, the Lovings took their case to the Supreme Court. I tell the judge I love my wife. The court's unanimous decision allowed the Lovings to build their dream home and for more interracial romances to flourish. Number three, Joe and Jasminda Carr, Jess Bomra. Bend it like Beckham. I've never seen an Indian girl into football. I didn't even know they had a girl's team here. In this comedy drama, soccer brings together Jasminda, a young British woman of Indian descent, and Joe, an English Caucasian bloke. Jasminda's overprotective parents forbid the football obsessed teen from playing the sport, since they deem it inappropriate. That's not fair. He selected me. He? She said it was girls. The coach, Joe. See how she lies? I don't want you running around half naked in front of men. But Jasminda is headstrong and joins the team that Joe coaches, after which they ultimately fall in love. I don't need you to feel sorry for me. You bitch! As a couple, they're strong-willed, but it's their love of soccer that really connects them, showing that a common bond is a strong foundation for a relationship. The twosome is also so relatable and cute together that it's hard not to root for them. She called me a packy, but I guess you wouldn't understand what that feels like, would you? Jess, I'm Irish. Of course I'd understand what that feels like. Number two, Tony and Maria, West Side Story. Did you see he's one of them? No, I saw only he. There's only one thing they want from a Puerto Rican That's girl. a lie. Later, Tony. Get away. Stay out of this. Don't listen. She will listen to her brother before she listens to you. Perhaps one of the most tragic couples in pop culture, Tony and Maria are the 20th century version of Romeo and Juliet. They literally come from warring gangs, with Maria being from the Puerto Rican sharks and Tony being aligned with the Caucasian American Jets. But like Romeo and Juliet before them, their love was faded when Tony first laid eyes on Maria at the local dance. From there, their relationship progresses at lightning pace, with them symbolically marrying each other before Tony's ultimate downfall.
Their hope and love for each other are perfectly captured in their duets Tonight and Somewhere, which are two of the film's most iconic songs. Hold my hand and we'll halfway there. Hold my hand and I'll take you there. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Dr. John Wade Prentice Jr. and Joanna Joey Drayton. Guess who's coming to dinner? Drayton, I'm medically qualified, so I hope you wouldn't think it presumptuous if I say you ought to sit down before you fall down, I mean. He thinks you're gonna faint because he's a Negro. Controversial from its inception, this film was produced at a time when interracial marriage was still illegal in 17 U.S. states. Caucasian and upper-class Joanna brings home John, a widowed black man, which makes her liberal parents question their prejudices and their beliefs on race. I love your daughter. There is nothing I wouldn't do to try to keep her as happy as she was the day I met her. But it seems to me, without your approval, we will make no sense at all. It's hard to find faults with John, however, since he's a doctor who has done work in Africa and has refused to have sex with Joanna before they're married. How deeply are you and John in... in, in uh... No, no, I have no right to How deeply in involved? Do you mean have we been to bed together? I don't mind you asking me that. We haven't. He wouldn't. This means that her parents' only true objection to him is his race. Sidney Poitier's character broke stereotypes, and the loving relationship he has with Joanna pushed audiences to examine their own views. As for you two and the problems you're going to have, they seem almost unimaginable. But you'll have no problem with me. The film also inspired a more comedic update in 2005 with Guess Who, which reverses the roles and sees a black woman bringing a white man home to her parents. So what, they don't have any available young black men in New York anymore? Well, you know, they just ran out last week, hey. Grandpa. I'm just trying to figure out why you chose to go this way. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.